All right, folks, this is number 10 of a series of 15 in the book of Philippines. We're going to go out in the exhortation of chapter 2. If there be, Paul speaking here, therefore, any consolation in Christ, he's saying there is a consolation in Christ. And if it be in you, you will perform as Paul does. And this is what he's saying. And if any uh, comfort of love, that's having God in you. That's the comfort of love. God in you. If any fellowship of the Spirit, this refers to the Spirit of God coming into you and you having the fellowship between you and God in you, and then you pass that fellowship on to the believers in which God has put the Holy Spirit. And they are now participants and they practice following God the same way you do. And they're servants of God even though we're not together. We're way apart. I have in-laws in the state of Maine who love Jesus Christ and love God, who follow God ardently. And they do work in their, their, they have a camp and they do work in their camp. And they win souls and they, they bring people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they follow through with carrying them through. This is what Paul was doing with Timothy, and it's also what he was doing with Aphrodite, and it's also what he's doing with us today. The same Paul, the same words, the same joy, the same peace, the same mercies. He said, with bowels of mercy. This is talking about being tender. The most tender spot on a person is his his bowels, and, this, and, and Paul was able to speak in that language in that day in a true manner without being ugly or without think, thinking about something dirty or nasty. But he's saying you need to put forth your bowels of mercy. The tender part of your life, put it forth that others may see Jesus Christ. To walk up there and allow yourself to be in harm's way. He said, fulfill ye my joy. The spiritual growth of the Philippians was the joy of God, of, of Paul, and the joy of God. That you be like-minded in the unity of mind. Have the unity of your mind and your heart. Having the same love. That's the kind of love. If you have the kind of love Paul had, you will suffer persecution. And think nothing of it. Let it run off your back like water off a duck's back. And don't let it bother you. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. This is forming sides. Be. Be. Tough day. Tough day today. Tough day today. People want to press you to be on their side. There shouldn't be a side unless it's a spiritual side. Do not, I say again, and I reiterate it, do not side with either side in a disputed case. Do not side with either side. Just put the facts up and say either one of you would willing, be willing to receive this fact right here as a problem for you and your life 
to the other one. Which ones of these facts that are on this board are you willing to admit is your problem? And then we can have a meeting of the minds and the hearts. I had to come to the fact at 2 o'clock in the morning, 1972, 2 o'clock in the morning, 1972, that I was a sinner. And say, God, this is a fact. This is my problem. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a cusser. I'm a thief. I'm a rogue. I'm everything under the sun that is opposite from you. But I want you to come into my heart, forgive me of my sin, and come into my heart. And he did. And gave me a complete change of life. A complete venue. New venue. Completely new and different. And this is what Paul is saying right here. This is what God did for Paul. Hey, my salvation was just, just as powerful as Paul the Apostle's salvation. God knocked him off his mule. He knocked me out of a car. <laughs> different era, different machine, different way of travel. He was traveling on a mule. I was traveling in a car. God knocked me out of my car. And said to me, your number's up. You get right now, I ain't speaking to you again. That's what he said to Paul too, believe it or not. Blinded his eyes. Wow. Took his eyesight away from him. Wow. Left him groping in the dark. He had to get somebody to lead him back to where God told him to go. Wow. He said his joy would be full. Uh, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem the other better than themselves. This is a point of view that many Christians haven't got today. You will never be a soul one <laughs> if you don't esteem others at least as you were before you got saved. Because before you got saved, you was a lost person on your way to hell. And as you got saved, now you're a saved person on the way to heaven. But you've got to esteem those others. It's important. And uh, let's go on. Verse 4. Look not every man unto his own thing. This means to look at other people's things, too. Not just your own, but help others. But every man also on the things of others. Are you interested in the affairs of others? Are you interested in the, the situation and... The, I pray for many people that don't see me and, and they don't know me and I'm praying for their situation. We have situations in the spiritual world and in the church that we pray for too. But then we have those in, out here in the world we pray for. This is a tough world to live in in this day and age. Let this mind be in you, Paul said which is also in Christ Jesus. This portrays the picture. Christ is the supreme example. Not doing something back against somebody that does something against you. Not saying something back to somebody that says something about you. 
Uh, you hear, well, so-and-so said this about you, Brother Pete. What is Brother Peter's statement going to be there? Say, well, you know, maybe he was right. <laughs> see, maybe he was right. Let me look at myself and see if that is a thing that's a problem with me. And if it is, I'll go apologize to him and tell him, hey, I find this is a problem with me, and I, I'm going to try to straighten it out so I won't be such a bad example in this area. How about that? Say if he was dead wrong. Well, say, I, I heard he said that, but you know, I feel like he's dead wrong about that. But uh, I get a chance to see him, I'll ask him about it and see why, why he thinks that. You know, there's a workable situation for everything if you'll face it properly. I remember the day I'm riding with my, my in the back seat. My sister's learning how to drive. And uh, my dad said, you're taking the corner too wide, sister. And she was too wide. When she turned, there was a taxi cab coming. She got him right mid in the middle of the door, tipped him right up. Here we are, setting up in the air. He's up in the air, we're up in the air. And she rolls the car back a little bit, and his car drops down. His door is bent, he can't get out of it. He gets out of the other side. He walks around, he walks up to my sister's window, and she rolls the window down. And he said to her, he said, Sister, it looks like you just bought a taxi cab. <laughs> just as calm, just as peaceful. I look back at that today and I say, that must have been a true Christian guy, that guy. He didn't get upset any which way, shape, or form. He just said, you just bought a taxi cab, sister. What a testimony for a man. See, I see back at that. I probably had that man not been the man he was, I wouldn't even remember it. But I remember it because of his demeanor. And that's how we should be as Christians. The Bible said, as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. And today what a lot of people do who call themselves Christians, bite like serpents. <laughs> They're not harmless as a dove by any means. <laughs> So we need to be very careful. So listen, look. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus also. What this put, these words portray, if you look at them in a picture, I like to look at words in a picture. Here's these words, and I'm going to see this picture. The picture is, is it supreme being Christ hung on a cross? And we can see the picture of Christ hanging on the cross for us in our mind's eye and giving us freedom. And he gave it to us. See, see, Jesus was God in the flesh, in the form of God, it says, verse 6, who being in the form of God, this refers to his deity. He was the third part of the Trinity, which Christ always was. He always was the Son of God when he was with God. But God made a way for him to come down and be born from a fleshly woman in a personage so that God in the flesh, God as a spirit and as an angel walked on this earth at times. It's called Christophanes, Christ before the New Testament. And Theophanes, that's the theoretical part of Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost appearing on the earth in the likeness of an angel. 
appearing to Jacob, appearing to Joseph, appearing uh, to Moses, appearing to others, others on the earth. In, in intense Bible study, going backwards from the New Testament, you find many appearances of angels coming and speaking. We remember just to Mary, all the way up to the most recent angel appearance uh, in the Bible, was uh, the angel appearing to Mary. He said, what are you weeping for? Who are you looking for? So I'm looking for Jesus. He said, he told me he was going to raise. In three days he'd rise up. He told you he was going. He left for three days and went down the heart of the earth and walked through the heart of the earth and preached to hell and took captivity captive, took paradise out of the heart of the earth, brought him up here and stopped and left to walk around a little bit and then he took him to heaven. He shed his blood on the mercy seat of God and put... Uh, took his children to heaven. And uh, so, uh, this look, which was also Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. See, Jesus was equal with God because he was the third part of the Trinity. When Jesus went over there and got baptized, why did he get baptized? He got baptized because God told him to. And he went over there and got baptized so God could speak out of heaven. And God spoke out of heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased with. Hear him. So he was the Son of God. That makes him God in the flesh because the, the God can't be separated from his three parts. He's God the Father, he's God the Son, and he's God the Holy Ghost. He's three in one. You and I are three in one. We're triune. I'm a body. I have a soul that is going to be with God forever. And I have a spirit. You cannot see my spirit. You can see the evidence of my spirit. But you can't see my spirit. And you can't see my soul. All you can see is my body. And when Jesus came, you could see his body. But you couldn't see his soul and his spirit, which were God in the flesh. And that's the only way you could see them. But made himself of no reputation. Instead of asserting his rights... Ooh, we. We live in a day today when we human beings claim rights. I got news for you. You don't have a right to anything that you haven't earned the right to. How do you earn the right to go to heaven? Jesus said, if you will ask me to forgive you of your sin, come in your heart and save your soul, humble yourself. I will give you the right to go to heaven through my shedding of blood on the cross. If you will humble yourself and ask him, then you have that. But he didn't make of himself no reputation. Of the expression of his essence, of his deity, was given to us on the cross. And, and we get that. He took on the form of a servant. He walked across this country. And he, and his, this country, and he, he healed people. Uh, his first act of servantry was he turned that water into wine. I know your question. We ain't supposed to drink wine. Well, new wine wasn't fermented. Brand new wine was brand new wine. When you mashed the grapes, you had brand new wine. It was months before it could be worked with and tra transferred from jug to jug, bottle to bottle, vat to vat, and turned into 
and alcohol-based wine. Jesus made new wine. The best. And the, the host said this was the best. Anything Jesus did was the best. So present the Lord. The Lord is come and presented a new state of being where he became man. But his being man did not exclude his position with the Father and with the deity. While becoming man, for you and I, he laid aside his expression of deity. He said, I'm willing to lay myself down. Come down in the body and lay my body down. The fact of deity is the three-in-one deal, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And that's called the passion of Christ. When he went to the cross and gave his life. He did, his passion lasted 33 years. From the day he was conceived in his mother's womb until the day that he went to the cross and left this earth in death was the, left his body here in death and he went back spiritually to be with the Lord. Uh, that was his deity. The deity of Christ. You say, well, I've heard deity all my life but I don't understand what it was. Well, that's what it is. That's what it is the best, best way I can explain it. That's what it is. Being found in the fashion of a man that denotes God to be in the fashion of a man. But remember this. Remember this. Jesus and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost were in heaven. And they said, let us make man in our own image. And they came onto this earth and made man and laid him down by the river Euphrates. How long did he lay there? I don't know how long he laid there. There are a lot of questions we can't answer. But, it, but God made this man. He laid him down there by the river Euphrates and he laid there a bit. God the Father and God the Son in heaven are having a little conference. And the Holy Spirit says, I, I'll go down there and fill him with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus and God said, wait a minute, let's look at this situation. We have made this man, let's give him a volition. What is that? That is a will to choose whether he wants to be righteous or whether he wants to do something wicked and that will be called the fall of man. So they bent down from heaven and breathed the breath of life into that man, gave him a spirit. And breathed the breath of life and he became a living soul. Now here's this man, Adam, on this earth. He's a spirit, a body, and a soul. But he's not a holy man. He's a regular man with a plain spirit that's not a holy spirit. He is going to have a choice with what he does with that spirit. How long he was in the garden. We don't know how long he laid there. and We don't know how long he was in the garden. But we do know that there was fruit on the trees. 
If God planted the garden and made the man at the same time and it was fruit on the trees, there was a period of time unless God made the trees with the fruit already on them. So here's a man in the garden, has fruit on the trees, and here's a man that has yet not made a choice. The first choice that mankind is going to make was a wrong choice. Here's two people, totally innocent, 100% innocent of any evil or good, even though there was good there in the garden, they, they were innocent of what was even what was good. There was this evil creature in the garden named the devil. And he said, I am going to rob God of these people. And this is the way I'm going to do it. I'm going to ask the woman, hath God said this or that? And I'm going to tempt her to take a bite of this fruit. And he did. And he won. And she did. Now here comes Adam. Eve does not reveal to Adam that she can see that he is now a naked man. Even though they were naked, they didn't know it because they were dressed in the holiness of God. But she has lost her holiness. But Adam hasn't lost his yet. So she tempts him to bite the fruit. And he does. And starts the ball rolling, the spiraling ball rolling down away from God. Away from God. But the mercy of God clothes those people. Rather than God immediately saying, I'm just going to kill them both. No. He said, they've done what they've done, and I'm going to have mercy. And he clothed them. But in his mercy, there was some work involved. That man from that day forward would have to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. We don't know how long they were in the garden, how long they ate of the garden without sweating, without working. What we're saying, the non-sweating is without working. There were no thorns and there were no thistles. There were no briars. There was nothing that could hurt the body of man on this earth. The serpent didn't bite man. The serpent didn't bite animals. The serpent was on the earth, but he was not a creature that was evil, bit things, even though he had the ability to be evil. He came to Eve as an evil, as a serpent. The devil came as a serpent. I think he was a beautiful creature. Looked look something like a cow but had the ability to speak to eat. But was cursed to crawl on his belly from that day forward. In the form of a serpent. We see that as the form of a serpent. So therefore, be nothing terrified, he said. We're, we're back in Philippines here. This is what we're talking about. And we're going... We've gone off into the beginning to come back to here. The which is them an evidence token of perdition. But you are salvation and that of God. Verse 28. We, got, we went all the way back over there to Genesis to the making of mankind 
from this verse. Verse 28. Being not terrified of that adversary. That was the same adversary that tempted Eve. Still around. Still doing the same thing. On a daily basis. All the time. So, he said, follow that which is to them. No, be careful of that which was to them evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and to that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ. Now Christ came and died on the cross in his behalf, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. <laughs> what kind of suffering do we do for Jesus? Today there's not very many people who do any kind of suffering for Jesus Christ. Who give their life for the Lord. Who would get up in the night and go help a person. Or to go out of the way physically to help somebody that's in need. Or to help somebody that's in need spiritually. This is one of the most important things. This is a spiritual thing. That we help somebody spiritually. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Paul was in conflict with the devil, always. He was always in conflict with the devil. And it caused him bodily harm. And he's hanging in stalks, and he's over there, and he's in bonds, and he's writing to these folks an exhortation for them to bypass hatred, to bypass sin, to bypass the things of the world, and do everything in love. Our time's gone by. I will see you next time. This is Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Our next excerpt will be number 11. Bye-bye.